this is Indian country today. Esquilly, yes, and thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungba. The FBI is investigating a shooting at a protest last night in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It happened outside of a museum where protesters wrapped a chain around a statue of the Spanish conquistador Don Juan de Oñate to try and pull it down. A group called the New Mexico Civil Guard was also there to protect the statue. They were armed, and when one protester started swinging a pickaxe at the base of the statue, someone fired a shot at the man. He's in stable condition. City officials are removing the statue now until they determine the next steps. The police and the FBI are investigating the situation. One man was taken into custody. This came just hours after another statue of the Spanish conquistador was removed without incident at a city in the northern part of the state. Oñate is known for his brutality of Pueblo men. He had the right foot cut off of 24 Pueblo men as a form of punishment. And in New Hampshire, uh, a copper weather vane is coming down too. It is being removed from the main library at Dartmouth College. The 600 pound vane was, de was designed in 1928 and it shows a Native American man wearing feathers and smoking a long pipe and he's seated on the ground in front of the college founder. The circular object behind the founder may be a barrel of rum according to historical records. Students and alumni have raised concerns for years about the, the weather vane calling it racist and demeaning. Dartmouth College President Philip Hanlon says the weather vane does not represent the values of the college and it will be removed. And despite all the protests taking place across the country, we are still in the midst of a global pandemic and it's having a huge impact on the Mississippi Band of Choctaws. WLOX reports that the state officials there say the tribe has the highest mortality rate from COVID-19 than any other ethnic group in Mississippi. The tribe is reporting a total of nearly 800 positive tests and 47 deaths. More than 500 tribal members have recovered from the virus. One of the challenges they face, according to health officials, is the movement of the young people. Officials say tribal youth have been contracting the virus and spreading it to their families. Their tribe has 3,000 households in eight communities. And now for the latest numbers of COVID-19 cases in Indian country, let's go to Jordan Benabigay, our Washington editor. Jordan? We received COVID-19 updates from six tribes across the country. And what's surprising about these news cases today is they are all less than 30 which hasn't been you know, the case since the pandemic has started. Uh, here are the latest numbers from our database. There are 10,130 positive confirmed cases and 406 deaths in the Indian health system. Again, that is a total of 10,130 positive confirmed cases and 406 deaths as of June 16th. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in Mississippi reported nine new cases and four more deaths. That brings their total to 821 cases and 53 deaths in total. In Nebraska, the Winnebago tribe and Omaha, Omaha tribe announced more cases. The reservations of both tribes sit next to each other. The Winnebago tribe has nine new cases since we last logged the tribe in our database. This brings the total to 64 cases and the Omaha Tribes Health Center announced five new cases as of June 14th, giving them a total of 66 cases. In the Colorado River Indian Tribes in Arizona saw an increase of 17 cases. The tribe has a total of 172 cases right now. And the, uh, the White Mountain Apache Tribe also in Arizona announced 14 new cases. They have a total of 1,273 cases and 17, 17 deaths. The Navajo Nation that spans across three states in the Southwest is reporting 22 new cases. This gives the tribe a total of 6,633 cases and 311 deaths. Uh, and through all this data, you know, Indian Country Today is keeping track of the positive test, tests through tribes' websites, news releases, updates in their social media, and the submissions we receive through the Google form. And this Google form can be found on our platform under the COVID-19 syllabus. And once we get this information, we reach out to the tribes to verify the numbers. And portraits from the pandemic is definitely a important part of the story. And if somebody in your tribe or your family passes away from COVID-19, this is a place to tell their story and show the world that these individuals are more than statistics and they're Native people with their own life stories.
All right, Jordan Ben and Begay, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be right back. This is Indian Country Today. Welcome back. Imagine graduating from medical school and in your first year as a doctor, you find yourself treating patients in a global pandemic. Are you really prepared for such a situation? Preparing for all sorts of emergencies, including pandemics, is taught in med school, but of course there are differences in training and actually doing the work. Dr. Walt Hollow, Assiniboine Yankton Sioux, is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He's also the president of the Association of American Indian Physicians. Through the years, he has also taught and mentored hundreds of, of Native medical students who are now physicians. He joins us today to talk about the physician's perspective of medical care in a pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Hollow. Thank you very much. Well, let's go back to your career. Um, you were the first Native American to graduate from the University of Washington's uh, medical school. Uh, what was that first year like for you as, as a doctor? Uh, as I look back, it was scary. Um, we had a huge class of 212 medical students and I was uh, the only Indian in the class. Uh, so it felt scary and uh, also lonely because there were no other Indians that were around. And then in your medical training, you know, you took some courses, of course, even back then, I suppose, on emergencies and pandemic training. Can you imagine what, how you would have faced it if you were a first year uh, medical doctor and facing a pandemic? Yes, I'm sure it would have been uh, frightening. Uh, I know that um, when the pandemic hit here, um, our medical school made a decision to um, not let medical students uh, see patients when they were out on the wards. And the reason for that was to conserve PPEs, which were in short supply. And so medical students were removed from actually seeing patients and it was to conserve PPEs and face masks so that they could be utilized by the intern or resident uh, or the attending physician who were actually seeing and managing a sick patient. Well, that's, that's certainly an area, again, where you realize this pandemic is impacting all of our communities and, and all of these different areas. And yes, PPE was a huge uh, a concern in the very beginning. Um, is that still the case now? Are you still limiting students uh, from, or, or um, uh, are they still being limited on that, in that end? Well, the, they actually are uh, uh, through the summer. We anticipate that we will let them back to see patients in the fall. And fortunately, PPEs are not in short supply. Um, for most of the teaching facilities. And so that's no longer an issue. Um, so medical students should be getting back into seeing patients by this fall. Okay, so, so that was a temporary uh, setback for medical students. Yes. So in, in your curriculum, in teaching emergency and, and pandemic, what are those differences? It's you know, one thing to have a hypothetical situation and another thing to be in that situation. Well, um, public health issues are taught in the medical school. And you're right, there's usually theoretical cases that medical students work on. Um, for instance, um, the case that I had when I was a medical student had to do with food poisoning at a traditional Indian marriage. 
and um, the person who smoked the salmon, um, the heat went off and his fish got contaminated with salmonella. And uh, when they put it on the table to slice the meat up, uh, it cross-contaminated several other sources of food and people who attended the wedding several days later got sick. But tracking all that down was the uh, public health case. And that was a good uh, learning event for me anyway. Um, with our current pandemic, medical students are studying how a virus like the coronavirus uh, multiplies and is spread and shed from a person. And when you have uh, one person with the virus that's shedding and one person who's free of the virus and those two people meet up, uh, the, you have to be able to track where each of those people go and who they have contact with in order to minimize um, passage of the virus. And that's where quarantining comes into play so that when you identify an individual with the virus, you quarantine them so they no longer have contact with anyone and that would limit the spread of the virus. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it is just unbelievable. We've been in this, in this pandemic now in the, in the US at least, and it was probably since you know, the first part of March, uh, other cases before that, but still a couple of months in, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. We're seeing spikes across the country in different states, and um, and we don't have a, a virus or a, a vaccine for this at this point. So, as you're as you're coming into a new semester for medical students, is there anything that's changed now in teaching about pandemics or teaching about these kinds of emergencies? Well, nothing has really changed, um, and you're right. We do not have a vaccine, and uh, I, I hope we have a vaccine by December or January, but that's hopeful thinking. And until we have a vaccine, uh, medical students would be at risk for coming down with the virus if they don't take proper precautions when they do see and examine patients. And so our job at the medical school would be to teach them about PPEs, how to put them on, how to take them off, uh, and how to prevent themselves from being exposed when they have to talk with and then examine a patient who may be carrying the virus. I'm, I'm thinking about basic, you know, uh, resuscitation, CPR, and how would that change? We know that during the uh, AIDS uh, uh, epidemic, there was a lot of concern about providing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and there was, a, I don't know what it's called, a contraption in my words, um, so a, a, like a tube that you could separate the two uh, mouths from. Is that also going to be the case for this, you know, as, as medical providers are trying to provide CPR to patients? Uh, yes, and mouth-to-mouth um, -mouth re resuscitation would, would not be utilized, and we would try to do it with what's called an ambu bag, which is a, a bag that you squeeze and it um, puts air and oxygen into the oropharynx of a patient and that avoids mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth contact. And you can ventilate someone like that for a, a fairly long period of time, but obviously um, it would have to be short-lived or the person squeezing the ambu bag would wear out. And so you'd need yeah. several people to replace each other. And that's where the ventilator comes in because that then does the job of breathing if the patient is sick enough to require that. Wow, there's a, a lot of things to consider. What are you hearing from your former students uh, about this pandemic and how they're treating patients? What are they telling you? Well, um, most of my students um, are working in the WAMI area. So the University of Washington is the medical school for Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. And many of those uh, have reservations that are fairly remote. And actually, um, the epidemic hasn't hit several of those reservations yet. The doctors are waiting for it, 
they know it's coming, but they haven't uh, experienced a huge surge of patients like we see in many of the urban areas uh, where the virus spreads uh, much more rapidly. Um, so the doctors uh, in many of the communities in Whammy Land are carefully waiting for the onset of the virus and testing. And fortunately, um, the test rates uh, are below 5% when they turn positive. So the rates are fairly low at many of the reservations. But we anticipate that that may change at any time. Yeah, well, everything seems to be changing so much, you know, even with what we know about the coronavirus. Uh, what are some of the changes that you've seen in the coronavirus from when it was first detected and until today? Well, I think, um, the, we at first thought it was mainly a respiratory virus and that it would affect mainly the lungs, but we have uh, since found out that it unfortunately, um, well, affects the immune system of some patients and it makes our immune system attack your own body and that affects other organs than the lungs. And so, if you happen to be one of the patients where your immune system is activated to attack your body, uh, that could affect your liver, your kidneys, your heart, your brain, your, all of your blood vessels. And so if you get that severe total body inflammatory response, you can get real sick real fast and the likelihood of full recovery then diminishes greatly. So at first we thought it was mainly uh, a pneumonia-like virus that would affect only the lungs, but we now know it can affect the whole body. And that's the difference. Wow, it's just, it's, it's, um, it is pretty uh, unbelievable. Again, I keep going, coming back to that word, you know, that we're living in this time and we're in such a mobile, society now that this virus really can travel globally and that it's shown it to do that. Um, and in this whole process, are, we, are you hearing from more people who want to go into medicine, uh, young native people calling up? And, uh, and if so, you know, what are the voids that we're seeing in this, uh, in this pandemic? You know, for example, do we need more people who, who know how have a specialty in respiratory illnesses or have a specialty in you know, any kind of treatment that's needed for this uh, coronavirus? Well, I think that, uh, yes, you need physicians who uh, can take care of the lungs and a situation where you have a pneumonia-like illness, but you also need physicians who know how to tone down the immune system when it uh, causes inflammation in the body. And we realize that the immune system causing inflammation, uh, that is what affects all of the other organs in the body. And we need to turn the immune system down so it's not so aggressive, yet not too much, or the virus will totally take over your whole body. So that's a balancing act. Um, you, you don't want the inflammatory process to go on uh, uh, without any halting it, but you need to turn it down so that it isn't affecting the body in an adverse way, but not turn it down so much that you stop the immune response. Otherwise, that puts you at risk for any kind of infection. So you'd suffer from secondary infections. And are you, are you seeing young Native people now expressing interest in those areas of medicine? Um, yes, we are. And um, we're also seeing physicians that are interested in public health and looking at and studying how a virus like the coronavirus spreads and how it can uh, become a worldwide pandemic and what are the strategies for uh, minimizing that 
and the effect it has on the world population. So we have, you, you have, you, you've had students con or potential students contacting uh, your association to learn more about these kinds of medical fields? Yes. Uh, we have more Indian students who are talking with our office staff about how to get into medical school. And we uh, hold pre-admission workshops to help teach Indian uh, students how to become medical students and how to apply to a school of medicine and write a personal statement and uh, make themselves as presentable as possible for getting into a medical school and start their training. And so, well, that's really hopeful. You know, that's really great information uh, to know that, you know, there are more Native uh, youth who are wanting to go into the field of medicine in different areas and specialties. Uh, for those first year uh, doctors, uh, the first year people out there on the front lines right now, how are you advising them to take care of their own mental health and their physical health in this pandemic as they treat patients? Well, uh, for Indian medical students, uh, I would identify who uh, lives a traditional lifestyle and follows the traditional ways of their tribe. And uh, for those that do, I encourage them to utilize those traditional ways to manage their stress, their anxiety, um, as they learn about the virus and its bad effects, which can be uh, scary. Now, first year medical students in most medical schools really are not seeing patients. They're mainly learning about the human body and all of the different organ systems, and they learn about how it works normally and then how it works when a disease strikes one of the organs. It's not until your uh, second, and third, and fourth year that you start seeing patients and learning the science that you acquired in your first year of medical school uh, that you start seeing patients. And that's when using traditional ways would help a medical student manage their stress. Well, I think it's important for, for all of us in, in, as we experience this pandemic and we're at stay-at-home orders or, or we're self-quarantined just because we don't want to expose ourselves to uh, the virus itself. Um, when it comes to cultural sensitivity training in medical school and, and in this current climate especially, um, are you seeing any changes or improvements being talked about now to implement in the fall semester? Uh, yes. For instance, the uh, sweat lodge uh, ceremony. Uh, normally, it's a communal sweat lodge. And so the person who owns uh, or runs a lodge will invite the community in to participate in a sweat lodge. But we recognize that that's not a healthy thing to do given the pandemic because the virus would spread very quickly in a sweat lodge with people being in close contact and possibly passing a pipe around. Um, so um, we have been advising people who have sweat lodges to only do a sweat with their immediate family and not allow the community in until uh, we have a vaccine and we see that the pandemic is improving. All right. Well, a lot to consider. And before we go, uh, Dr. Hollow, any last uh, bit of advice uh, for, for, for people who are, are being treated for COVID-19? Uh, any last bit of advice? Yes, I, I would say that you should um, wear your face mask if you're leaving your home and uh, possibly use uh, rubber gloves and um, practice and use PPEs if you're going to be in close contact, but you really should try to avoid close contact situations and groups as much as possible because that's how the virus is likely to spread. All right. And even if the, even if you're, and we're seeing a change, you know, some states may be open for business, but tribes are saying, no, we're still closed down. So your advice is even if uh, uh, states and cities open up, you're still advising people to stay home. 
I would. You know, until there's a vaccine, I don't think any of us are are going to be safe. And, uh, right. you know, particularly for someone who is elderly. So anyone who's 50 years old or older, I w would really encourage them to stay home as much as possible. And if they go out, use a face mask, use gloves, and use all those protective devices that would help them not accumulate the virus. All right. Well, Dr. Walt Hollow, thank you so much for joining us today. Very good. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Uma umukatsi ukkalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tholohungba. Join us again tomorrow. is Indian country today.